Awesome. All right, so I guess I'll cut it right here. Um, welcome to our first TOK talk at EF Academy. Um, last year, obviously, you would have seen an auditorium full of students and a uh, stage, but obviously in these uh, strange times, we are using the tools that we have. Um, so our first panel uh, includes our TOK teacher, Jason Markowitz, our administrator, Gabriella D'Ambrosio, our um, arts teacher, Giovanni Villeri, um, and two of our TOK year students, Irvin Grimaldi and Michelle Yuan. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna start with a classic kind of Goldsberry and Gambit, and that is to ask whether you, uh, um, from the start, agree or disagree with the prescribed title. So, um, Mr. Goldsberry usually phrases this as completely agree, somewhat agree, somewhat disagree, and completely disagree. Um, so I'm looking at the Brady Bunch screens. Uh, Mr. Valeri's in the top left, so I'm gonna start with him, um, and we can kind of just go from there. Um, also, Mr. Valeri, if you wouldn't mind reading the prescribed title, if you have it on your screen there. I don't have it on my screen, but I can get it. I, I've got it, if, um, got it? please. Okay. Yep, so the title says, accepting knowledge claims always involves an element of trust. Discuss this claim with reference to two areas of knowledge. So, uh, you know, as, as many things like this, it, it really depends on, on the approach you take to the title and to the question. Um, you know, as it is, like on its, as a statement, I would completely disagree. Um, but, uh, you know, th then if we go and, and sort of define what it is that we mean by trust, what we mean by, uh, you know, uh, accepting uh, truth, what we mean by truth, um, then we can find many, many situations in which this is a, a, a fact and a truth. Um, a, a statement that I would agree with, um, you know. I think uh, I think of something as the arts, where um, there are many accepted things uh, that that are that are just you know uh, taken at, at 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 face value without really having to discuss them, without really having to uh, prove them. Um, in, in music, in, in visual arts, in theater, in, in performing arts, uh, you know, the fact that what we research is beauty is a given and not something that, that, that necessarily needs to be uh, addressed or discussed. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, there isn't anything uh, in the nature of the arts that, that is not subject to personal taste. And as such, there's no trust in any other's person's opinion ever involved, you know, you, something, you like something or you don't like something. And as such, your judgment is never uh, secondary to anybody else's uh, assertions, if that, if that makes any sense. So I'm going to hop in, actually, if I could. Yeah. And it's interesting because I, my tendency is to completely agree with the prescribed title, which that's how we know that it's going to be a good one. So um, I just want to start by taking a couple of words in the title and taking a closer look at them. So um, the title says always involves an element of trust. So if it had said that trust is the basis for knowledge, I would have completely disagreed because that causes a lot of problems when trust is the only element. But I think of situations like uh, the justice system or, or the court system, where there are different uh, standards of how sure or how proven something has to be before you accept it. So we have things like uh, probable cause, or we say proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, we don't say proof full stop. And so I think the, the concept of accepting a knowledge claim, the way I interpret that is, being prepared to sort of act as if it's true. So like if it's, a, if it's in the court system, being prepared to render a verdict one way or the other, even if you're not 100% certain. 
um, or to take a case in the arts, um, to be able to have enough trust in the value of what you are going to say or going to produce in order to accept it in the sense of being willing to take the jump to produce it. See, what, what I, I think that the one word that for me stands out and that I take the most sort of uh, offense in air quotes with is uh, the word always. Um, mm -hmm. Saying that something always requires, even if it's just a piece of trust. So trust is not the foundation of, of uh, what we are using, right? Uh, which I completely agree with you on. But saying that that always has to be the case uh, I take issue with that because I can think of many situations where there is no trust involved. There is no, so again, uh, if I'm thinking of a theater production, um, I, I, there, there is never a situation in which you would put up a play without rehearsing it, trusting that you know, you know the element of, no matter how well prepared you have been up until this point, there is always going to be a, a, a judgment call made on uh, what you're doing. Now, we could talk about like, but how do you trust your judgment, right? So there is an element of trust on what you have uh, previously done, but then we need to define what, what, what trust mean. Is trust something that is based on uh, experience or is trust something that is based on just like, you know, blind belief. So it, that's why I think we, we need to qualify what trust is before we can really uh, decide whether we agree or disagree. The thing that, 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 that one word that stands out for me is the always. And I have, I have personally, I have a lot of issues with any like absolute statement. So saying always makes it to me an absolute statement, which I then find, find issue with. I think that's a great so the next, Sorry, Mr. Mark. Just, I think that's a great sorry, just the, the next word always is followed by an element of trust. So I just wanted to, I think what, what the crux of this is going to be is how big is that element? Yeah, and I think that there's a pretty good segue to the first question I kind of had dialed in for you guys in terms of uh, trust is another term that jumped out to me. But before I go there, I would like to hear the answer to the first question from our other panelists. Do you completely agree, somewhat agree, somewhat disagree? So we have, we have our two extremes already. I was wondering where you guys fall in that. I think I personally somehow agree with it, considering it is the always involves an element and like an element doesn't have to be a really big part or a small part, but it's also how we go, we are going to interpret trust that really matters, like uh, from how certain is trust kind of like how much facts or how much do we need to back up trust compared to for example, belief, because they can be used as synonyms, but I feel like belief is more up there in the air, while like trusts usually have something to back it up with. Um, I'm, I somewhat agree, but there's still like this word always, always, as Mr. Beast already said, it's kind of strong. It's that, it's all, always means always happen, right? It's 100% that's, that's, that's gonna happen. But we can't be actually sure. And also we, are, we have to under, understand, in my opinion, what we, are, what we um, define as an element of trust, right? So this can also depends on our perspectives. Uh, but for me, the biggest problem is here is always. Always, I think is like, can kind of impossible in real life. It's like something I prefer, like just leave it for um, sure things like mathematics, like stuff like that, in my opinion. So I disagree with the statement because similar to what Urban is saying, across time, place, and space, and across all the areas of knowledge, knowledge and trust are not concrete enough for me. They change no matter what phase of life you're in, where you're from, and what you come to know to be true. And if you look back on a lot of the things that we knew to be true as humans throughout history, so much of it has changed. So I agree that there has to be trust for there to be accepting knowledge from somebody, like a teacher, for example. You have to trust your teacher to accept knowledge from them. But I disagree that 
with the statement as a whole because knowledge and trust changes and is so transient throughout time, place, and space. Could we maybe talk about uh, the, the word accepting? I think that's a key word too because it's a bit softer than knowing for sure. I, I would say that accepting is, um, the way I interpret that is to be prepared to act as if something is true, which is something that we have to do all the time. I mean, in the arts, for instance, in order to produce something, you have to have some element of trust in the value of what you're saying or your experience in order, I think, to make the thing that you're, or create the thing that you're trying to make. Um, in the same way, even in, even in the hard sciences, um, because as you pointed out, Mr. Ambrosio, the knowledge changes so often, um, we still have to act, even in science, in situations where we don't have absolute certainty. When, it, when there's a vaccine for COVID-19, hopefully sooner rather than later, it will go through the entire rigorous scientific method all the way up to peer review. And still, we won't be certain ever that it's effective. But nonetheless, we'll have to accept, uh, because of a trust in the, the scientific process, we will have to act as if it's true. With the knowledge that perhaps some point down the road, it will prove it, be proven to be ineffective. But we would never, I don't think, act unless we were prepared to accept it to the extent that we act as if it's true. It would really, I think, be, um, it would paralyze our ability to, to act if we needed absolute certainty. And I, and I think that actually leads into another question that I had, which kind of is an attempt to flip the question on its head a bit. If, if we were theoretically certain of something, so certain of a kind of knowledge, would it be necessary to accept it if it was just so axiomatically true? Is acceptance a necessary piece for you to act upon that knowledge? It's an interesting. So um, my, my background in, in mathematics, which is completely opposite to my background in, in uh, arts and theater, uh, tells me that, yes, you, you do, in a way, have to, like, um, and, and again, this, this goes back to what is, what is trust? What do, we, what do we imply by trust? Because if we're saying, you know, and to your point, like, what, if trust is something that it needs to be justified, then, then yes, of course, there always has to be an, an element of trust. So, for example, if we go to the, to the uh, Cartesian, like, you know, am I sure I exist? I think therefore I am, right? But anything else I can't be sure of, uh, you know, what if there is a demon that is making me imagining that, that I exist, right? I have to trust my senses, at least to a certain extent. Um, so uh, to me, that's not what we're discussing here because uh, otherwise everything becomes uh, uh, out, of, out of the realm of the actual possible uh, discussion, right? It, it becomes all too theoretic. Um, but if by trust we mean that we are uh, encouraged or, or drawn to accept a truth without having to uh, measure it for ourselves, without having to prove it for ourselves, either through our senses or through our logic or through our, our uh, other means of exploration, right? Uh, so for the arts, trust is in a teacher who tells me, do this thing this way, it'll work, right? Draw a line this way, it'll make it look like perspective. Well, that trust doesn't exist unless I see it. I will not believe somebody telling me to do something a certain way unless I do it that way and it works, or if I try it and it doesn't work, right? So in that sense, I don't think that there always has to be an element of trust in the arts. Um, whereas in mathematics, it, it, it does have to exist as a, as a constant, you know, math teaches us that math is not self-sufficient, that you have to have axioms without which you can't build a mathematical uh, structure, right? Um, uh, the, the can't remember the name of the theater, theorem, but there's a logic theorem that says that you cannot prove all theorems. That there are oh, things the, that are not the incompleteness. Proven. The incompleteness theorem. The incompleteness theorem. So that says that you have to have axioms, and you have to trust those axioms to hold. Otherwise, everything you have built on doesn't work. Now, again, usually those axioms are pretty much self, uh, self-evident. You know, one plus one equals two. That's an axiom. You can't prove that. Uh, and you then build arithmetics on that, right? If one plus one equals two, then 
two plus one equals three, and I can prove that. But, but you can't prove the first step. And you have to put trust in that first step. Uh, and yes, there is empirical vision. You know, I take one napkin plus one napkin and I can count two napkins. But when I start thinking in, in just mathematical terms, I need to trust that my empirical findings translate to this ideas world that is the realm of math. And that is, that is a place where trust is necessary. I wonder if in the arts, the, the axiom is your feelings. Like you, you can't, you can't, you have to have some element of trust in a feeling in order to communicate. Uh, I wonder what uh, Erwin, uh, Michelle, where are you guys on this? Could you, repeat, could you repeat the last part, please? Oh, I, well, I was just saying that, that I think um, in the arts, uh, an element of trust is required in order to, like if I want to uh, play music and I want to communicate a certain emotion when I'm playing piano, let's say, if I don't feel that emotion or I don't feel it genuinely, there's no way I'm going to be able to accept the claim, meaning produce the music that conveys that. Like if I, if I like acted like I felt sad, but I didn't really, I couldn't, and if I didn't trust that emotion, I think that I wouldn't be able to produce good music, for instance. I think about like in music, for example, you have your keys on the piano, that's supposed to be the happy keys and the sad keys, kind of, I don't remember the terms anymore, but I major think- Major minor key, yeah. Yes, I think there should be, there needs to be kind of a feeling and the feeling probably comes from trust because you need to trust yourself that okay the sound is sad or the sound is happy and I think it is kind of universal in the sense that in music you do read notes and there needs to be a trust in the notes and like that everyone was taught the same for it to be a universal language to use in music. So basically you're saying like we have to trust the base, like the base of the music, like the fundamentals to understand and the music in itself, right? It's like you have to believe in the fundamentals. Yeah, that there needs okay. to be some trust in the fundamentals. And then like, it's more about what you personally like and what your own opinion is, but there needs to be an element of trust for it to happen. So I, if I can jump in here, um, I disagree because the reason that we have the, 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 the happy keys and the sad keys, right? The major and the minor chords and, 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 and all of that is not because we trust that they will work, but because we always react to them universally, right? So a piece of music that sounds upbeat and happy will sound upbeat and happy to everybody. You don't have to trust that it will, you experience it. And and that's going to be the case for any piece of music that I write. I'm not going to trust that it does something unless I can experience it. I don't put trust in this will do that. I prove it in a way, like by, by, by putting myself in that, in that particular situation, um, you know, and as an actor, I absolutely and often uh, portray sadness without particularly being sad. Uh, that's part of my training. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't trust that acting sad will convey sadness without testing it out on an audience, without doing rehearsals, without seeing how it affects the people around me. And, and, and so again, there isn't, I think, an element of, you know, Unless by trust, we, we, we talk about self-confidence or like, again, experience. Like I have done this many times. It has always worked. There's no reason for me not to believe that it'll work again if I do it similarly. Uh, now, that is a trust, right? Yeah. I've done it. I trust it'll happen again. But for me, that's a stretch in terms of how we interpret the word trust. Michelle, go ahead. Yeah, I was just thinking that because doesn't the experience kind of lead and build up on the trust you have to it? Or is it just, do you think that the experience is something completely on its own? That's a great question. And I, I, I wrote down something earlier 
Um, I was trying to envision how each member of the department would kind of think about this question. So I already threw Mr. Goldsberry in there with his somewhat agree, somewhat disagree. Uh, Mr. Henkel really likes to look at uh, continuums. So if we consider trust as somewhere on a continuum between certainty and faith, I think that's kind of what Michelle is talking about right there. If um, the more experience you gain producing some kind of music or um, performing in some way, the more trust moves across the continuum closer to certainty and further away from faith. Um, but I was wondering what you guys thought about that. Where does trust fall on the continuum of certainty to faith for you? Or does it depend on a particular area of knowledge? Uh, Ms. D'Ambrosio, we haven't heard from you in a little bit. Yeah, no, I wanted to give space for our students to um, respond, but I do have something to say in regards to this. I think everything we're talking about is a social construct, was created by humans. And so those happy chords and sad chords, or even um, a degree, a PhD in a subject, those are all human and social constructs. And so I think I have an issue with trust because we're socially conditioned to feel a certain way depending on if somebody's gone to school for something or if they have experience in something. But then you learn about these instances where there's fraud, right? You know, Bernie Madoff, a very uh, successful person who a lot of people trusted and then he, um, you know, ripped them off or doctors who, you know, people who impersonate doctors and you feel like there's a level of trust and knowledge there, but then um, they turn around and it's not something, they're, they're not somebody you want to trust, right? And so I think the way humans are conditioned to trust because somebody has had experiences or education inhibits our ability to determine what is true and what's not true, what's knowledge, right? And so I think it really goes back to psychology and thinking, how do our brains work? Why do we believe these systems that we believe in? Who do we trust? Why do we trust them? And just questioning our own backgrounds in order to better inform the future and delineate between what is true, what is knowledge, what is not true. In terms of how big the element of trust has to be, I think it's a small element. And so the way I would put it is, it's, it's necessary, but it's never sufficient. It always is going to have to be there in order to act. Um, but we also would wanna be careful, I think, to not throw the baby out with the bathwater with, with instances of being kind of, of misplaced trust. So for example, in, in American politics, in the system of voting, we trust that people will make their own decisions and we trust that they will be, they will think critically and will be educated enough to make informed decisions. Now this doesn't always work. Um, sometimes in free and fair elections, uh, dictators get elected, for instance. And now, I don't think we would take that misplaced trust and say, we're going to throw out democracy as a system. I was just reflecting on um, the social construct thing that Mr. Ambrosio just brought up. And um, I was thinking about language and how, um, and I think Irving here can back me up, uh, in Italian, the word trust is almost a synonym of the word faith. So I think that's in part where my reticence against this, and I'm, 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 trying, to, I'm trying to separate my, my Italian language brain from my English language brain and try to rephrase the question, not with faith in mind, but with something like, like we were saying on a spectrum between faith and certainty and moving away from faith, which does... Uh, make me rethink some of what I was saying earlier in a different light. Um, I think it's not a coincidence that they use the word trust in this title because, you know, faith is no longer a considered a discrete way of knowing. Uh, and I think it's probably it was problematic for them because probably because of its religious connotations or whatever the case may be. So I think probably they, I see them as similar, if not synonymous, trust and faith. Um, I don't know what others others think. I see them as basically um, the final step that needs to be taken in order to accept a claim, whatever it is, in order to act on it. You'll never never attain pure certainty, but in order to make the step, in order to act as if it's true, whether it's in the sciences or whether it's in the arts or whether it's in the law, um, some amount of informed trust or faith in the system, I think, would be required. 
I feel like fate is kind of, they're syn- trust and fate are synonyms, but like fate is more of a looser word, a less certain word. Like if we use the spectrum that Mr. Lisnoda just mentioned, that fate can be described at like at zero and certain at a hundred. And I think I will place like believe at 25 and trust maybe at 75, just closer to certain. I don't know. I just feel like with trust, there's there has to be more facts or more knowledge to back it up. There needs to be something there while with fate, it's, it can be like completely blank. Like you can just go with your feeling and like, okay, I have faith in it. But like with trust, there needs to be something else to back it up. Kind of like if you think about uh, the in- indigenous knowledge system and like how they pass information to one another and how they really need to trust each other and they trust the older generation because of their experience. But I feel like there's more, they have faith in their gods they have, but they have more trust in the older generation because they have the experience, the facts and the knowledge. I just want to build on what Michelle is saying too. I find this conversation highly ironic because so many times in life we see people act on, um, you know, misinformation or they're not using knowledge and trust in order to enact change. Like, you know, to Mr. Markowitz's point about politics or in certain countries, right? Um, so I just think it's ironic that, yes, we believe we must, there must be an element of trust in order to accept knowledge to be true. However, so often in life, very few people and very important decisions are not based in trust or knowledge. That's why I think it's so important to get the, the extent right, because if the scale tips and it's more trust than reason or more trust than evidence, we know the kind of disaster that that can be, people blindly believing something. And that's why, that's why I guess my position is that trust is sort of the last element. I mean, trust cannot even make up the bulk of it because that would be kind of, that would lead to probably an unreasonable conclusion. So like someone was convicted of a crime on trust, no, we wouldn't want to live in a system where that was the case. Um, but by the same token, if we rely on absolute certainty before uh, a court made a decision, for instance, nothing would ever happen. Um, so I think, I think it has to be a small final element. Um, Mr. Lisnoda, I know you're gonna ask the question about the skyscraper, but I was thinking about that earlier. Uh, I guess I'm gonna take the question from your mouth that if, if a knowledge claim were a skyscraper, what would trust be? And I was thinking about this earlier, and at first I wanted to say the foundation but then I realized, no, that's not true at all because that means that the claim is mostly based on trust. So I decided it's gonna be the revolving door in the skyscraper. And the reason I said that is because you can build a knowledge claim, like build a legal case or build, compose music or um, create any kind of knowledge from the outside. But in order to, I guess, inhabit it, go through and claim it as your own personal knowledge, you've got to kind of go in through the door. And I guess revolving because um, it's temperamental. You might find yourself in a position where you're able to make the, the trust that's required to kind of like inhabit it, go in the building and own the knowledge. And you might, you might not, you might not. I'd love to hear what others think of that question, but I want to give a shout out to Mr. Johnson, who was the one who inspired the question in me. I'm trying to touch all the- Thanks, Mr. J. That. I know you're on. I think maybe in, I think it will be the staircase because you usually have the elevator, something that you use. So like something else, another element instead of trust, something you rely on daily. However, in case of an emergency or if something is uncertain, you have to have trust in it. You kind of have to believe in uh, your claim that it will, that you have to be the one that supports it and believes in it. But like, it's not necessary every day. It's rarely necessary, but in case of an emergency. So that's why I think it may be a staircase. Like, I don't know why, but I'm imagining like as like windows. It's just like something that you add after you have all the structure, all the fundamentals. It's not something really, I mean, yeah, it's necessary, but not like 
if you don't have it, you don't have a skyscraper. Uh, but it's something you look through every day. Like it's like a filter, somewhat. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, that was a great answer, Irvin. Um, um, in, in an effort to help out some uh, potential IB students who are going to be watching this, all the ones that I'm going to make watch this, for instance, um, I wanted to dive a little bit into some of the um, areas of knowledge we haven't really touched on yet. So Mr. Markowitz mentioned a couple of times the idea of like a court system, but I was curious what you guys thought of um, whether trust was a larger element or a lesser element in certain areas of knowledge. And the two that stick out to me as being hardest to pin down our ethics and history. How much uh, trust do you have to think about when you consider a knowledge came, uh, excuse me, a knowledge claim that is ethical or a knowledge claim that is history? Or perhaps a better way of thinking about it is which of those two AOKs, history or ethics, um, necessitates more trust? Can I respond to this one? Please. So this is really interesting because I think in a court of law and also in history textbooks, there are many accounts of what people saw and remembered. And then when you go back and ask those people, how did this situation go down? Many of them cannot fully remember and all have different accounts of the exact same situation, right? So what we see and what we hear is very subjective depending on who we are. And we all know that history books were written by certain people, right? Colonizers and usually white men in the past. And so how that perspective and there's a sense of mistrust right now especially looking back at the way history was told and unfolded for us because we're missing so many perspectives and so many different voices and so for history in particular I do feel like this is a subject where there is no trust because it's such a questionable account and yet you can't have a study in history unless you put some trust in the fact that you are able to piece together uh, things from like where you can't have proof because so far, despite my many attempts, I have still not been able to time travel. And so, nor has anybody else, right? So we can't actually go back in time and have a definitive proof of how things went. So as we are making a, a, a knowledge claim uh, for history, there has to be a degree of trust in our sources and our methods and our, our uh, you, you know, for as much as I can distrust a particular historian or even a particular like way of doing history, if I am to make a historical claim and, and come to a truth in history, there I, I, I completely agree. There has to be at least an element of trust because nobody can have definitive proof. Just, just to echo that, I, I think there's a fine but important distinction between uh, skepticism, which is important in every area of knowledge, and then which is subjecting every claim to doubt. And then when it goes to the point of nihilism saying we can't know anything about history, that then the discipline becomes inert because if we doubt every single claim to the point where we can't ever accept it, then the discipline basically disappears. Then it becomes just a matter of um, one person's interpretation over the other. So while um, I think there is, especially in history, no way to definitive, definitively, especially definitively interpret an event, um, history is sort of the competing interpretations, um, we don't wanna let that skepticism of each uh, claim go to the point where we just dismiss everything, because that gets to a point where then um, it becomes very difficult to have a footing uh, and to sort of realize that we, there, there are some things that we can know, if not with certainty, certainly with enough evidence to, as the title says, accept the claim and act as if it's true. Wouldn't the discipline in itself evolve over time, though, depending on how people view and accept knowledge? So history, yes, we w it wouldn't go away. It would just adapt and evolve depending on how people are, you, you know, using their accounts to tell history. Yeah. I think we've, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, Erwin, after you, sir. 
yeah, I was just like saying more in general. Like I think like with history, it's, the situation is kind of different because like as Mr. V already said, we can go back in the time and actually check if that's true, right? So we always have to trust uh, what other people say. But now there's still a there, there's still something that's called subjectivism, right? So you can't know everything about everybody, so you can't be objective hundred percent. So we gonna like year and year and read and depends uh, about history in different perspectives and we'll never be actually able to um, know the truth right the objective truth so we per we need trust for that and like imagine if we don't put trust so i say oh i don't trust them because like i could not see it with my eyes but we also know that we can't trust ourselves because maybe our uh, perception per percep perception is different right it's outright so we can't trust anything. We we stop have we have to stop to to live basically. So in this case, yes, trust is something we really have to trust. We have to trust in trust. Like, like yeah, and I think the word for that that's a great point. I think the word for that would be you know each claim needs to have some amount of credibility, believability in order to um, to go with it. But um, at some point, uh, we need to say that a certain level of credibility is enough to accept it as, if not the truth, certainly a truth. Um, I think that that's a good segue into one of the last questions I had, which was, um, is there a gradation of the amount of trust that you can have in a knowledge claim? So for, for instance, can I accept a knowledge claim in one area of knowledge, perhaps less than I do in another? Or can I accept a, a knowledge claim completely or only partially? If no one's going to go, I'm going to jump in. Um, I, I'm going to uh, ever the relativist again. I think it depends on uh, ultimately what 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 we're trying. Like, what are we trying to to uh, what what gradation are we trying to do? Like, is this a how much trust do I need in order to accept fully a claim or? Uh, when I accept a claim, do I accept it conditionally? Uh, so, you know, uh, going back to uh, Mr. Markowitz's um, example of, of a vaccine, uh, you know, uh, th there's, uh, there, in my everyday life, in a very pragmatic way, I trust that vaccines work. I have complete faith in partial effectivity of a vaccine. I don't think that vaccines will cure everything, right? They, they don't work 100% of the time. We know that. But at the same time, I have a pretty solid trust in the process of medicine and, and the science behind making a vaccine. So I, I trust that they work partially uh, the same way that, you know, I put the same sort of like, I don't have a partial trust, but in in a claim, but I have an understanding that the claim is not a hundred percent true all the time. Um, and, and we when we have to accept in the case of the vaccine, we will have to we will be in the position of having to accept the claim when the great day comes that we have a vaccine for COVID nineteen. We will have to accept, and we won't be certain that it works. We'll have to have some measure of trust in the scientific method, which has served us well so many times, but in the back of our mind, we might say, okay, I still have to, we still have to live with this, even if there could be some other subsequent study that reveals that any number of things, the vaccine, does, you know, this particular vaccine was poorly developed, it, something happened in the peer review process, whatever it is, we will have to eventually say, okay, this is the best we have. We can't let the perfect be the end of the good, and we will think, uh, be happy to uh, take the vaccine. So we're just about out of time, um, but I do want to come back to our opening question, which is, um, has anyone's opinion on the PT changed uh, significantly? So do you completely agree, somewhat agree, somewhat disagree, or completely disagree? And if we, we could just go through everybody really quick, or if you want to, you could explain. Well, I, I wouldn't say that change, but I still think like, trust is it's a word that's too broad right 
I still like I still don't feel that I still don't trust uh, that like we can be sure about that hundred percent. I like still believe that we can be sure of us trusting to in something because like we still have some psychological like um, an activation like a process that are like just biological, right? So it's like still can we trust or we just like sometimes we just believe it but it's like because it's still a difference like also linguistical as mr v again said and it's like very sub subjective in my opinion so like my is like maybe shift a bit but still not totally like i still think next frame is never a good choice trust definitely has an emotional element where you have to be willing to in, sort of be invested in the knowledge plan, which has a kind of emotional feel. You have to be willing to buy in to it. Um, and that, that, that level of willingness to be trusting definitely varies from person to person, I think. I also think um, just through this discussion that there's no way we can 100% trust and be concrete in that. There's always a gradient of that. However, if we allow ourselves and our skepticism to be stymied, we will never make any decisions about anything. And so we have to allow ourselves to be okay with partial trust. Or an element of trust like this. No. <laughs> right. uh, I think it, especially after like considering the my, my, my linguistical approach to the question and how it might have been influenced by my native language. Uh, I, I will shift away, I will, I, I'm coming away from this talk shifting from completely disagree to somewhat disagree. I still think like there, there, there are cases in which uh, I will not agree with the statement, but there, there are many cases in which, yes, it, it does make sense. And so I will put an element of trust in the title uh, proposed. That's very meta. <laughs> Well, if nobody has anything else, um, thank you very much for joining us on our first talk here at EF Academy. Um, uh, thank you to our two students, our uh, three teachers, and uh, I hope this is quite helpful to anyone who happens to pick it up uh, on YouTube later. <laughs> Everybody have a great night. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Thank you. Good talk. Bye.